say hello. Hello, hello. So a reminder to everyone that we are being recorded and these will be posted to YouTube. Let me get the meeting minutes link and encourage folks to please add themselves to the list of attendees. There we go. So a reminder to folks who are joining, these calls are recorded. They will be posted to YouTube. We usually start about five minutes or so after. Um, I've pasted the link into the chat. Uh, if you could please go add yourself to the list of attendees in the meeting minutes. Um, also, for those of you who are a little bit less familiar with the sort of way agendas are handled in Network Service Mesh, um, we're a really open regime when it comes to agenda. It is not at all uncommon for people to add themselves and in in, in the things they want to talk about uh, to the agenda themselves, including doing so as the meeting is in flight. So if there's something you would like to see added to the agenda, I would actually encourage you to um, go ahead and add it. We'll give it um, up until uh, 8.05, then we'll get started. All right, let's get moving. So welcome to the next uh, Network Service Mesh meeting. 
So we have this meeting every Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And um, so we are also participating in the telecom user group, which occurs every, uh, every first Monday. Uh, they are now rotating the time schedule. So the third Monday is no longer a thing. Instead, what they're doing is every, every, every month it'll be at 8 a.m. and then 3 a.m. Pacific is my understanding. I'll double check the time with Taylor. We had one yesterday uh, at 8 a.m. Pacific, so the next time should be one that is more friendly for, for Asia time zone. Um, again, I'll get the specifics and verify that before the next meeting. We also participate in the CNCF SIG network, which occurs every first and third Thursday of every month, uh, which means there should be one this, uh, this week. And, um, and that occurs at 11 a.m. There is a link in the, uh, in the meeting notes. Uh, major events. So KubeCon China has gone virtual. Uh, we also uh, participated in a cloud native uh, zero trust talk, uh, which I'm waiting for the recording to be uh, to be sent over to me. And uh, once I get that information, I will post it on here. And that was in last May for the OpenShift Commons group. You just got very faint, Frederick. I, What's up? I can tell you're talking, but I can't hear you. Uh, did you miss everything, or should I should I restart? Uh, I I think I missed maybe the last thirty seconds or so. I don't know what everyone else heard or didn't hear. Uh, Is this any better? Got that. Um, okay, I'll be, uh, where, where did where did you last hear me uh, leave off? Because that's probably what what happened. Um, I think you were going through events. You were just talking about Kubernetes, KubeCon uh, being going virtual. I think. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. So KubeCon has gone virtual uh, for for KubeCon China. We'll have more information soon. Uh, we have. Um, in May 26, we had a webinar to talk about Cloud Native Zero Trust, which had NSM um, highlighted side of it. That was through the OpenShift Commons. I will get the link to the recorded webinar soon. And once I have the link, I will post it in here. Um, on June 9th, uh, my company is going to be doing a webinar on federated learning of which uh, NSM is uh, going to be a key component of. And so I'm not going to be talking at this specific one. This is more for more of a high level uh, in terms of federated learning. But uh, if you're interested in federated learning or the use, the use case that we're going to be adding on, on top of NSM, then I uh, definitely recommend uh, uh, showing up to it. On August 17th is going to be KubeCon Cloud NativeCon Europe with a virtual experience. So uh, what this is, this is going to be ran just, just the way that the way that this is going to work now is that we're going to pre-record all the talks and Cube, and then what will happen is that the talks will be played and uh, the speaker will ideally be available for um, for discussion. So, uh, so this, this removes a little bit of the interactiveness um, a, a bit, but it also should, should result in more, uh, more professional videos. Um, and my guess is that it'll all be played on a European friendly time zone. So we also have ONES North America um, which uh, is going to, which, which is, uh, we still, we're still waiting for information and guidance on what's gonna happen there. And the same with uh, ONES uh, Europe. Um, my guess is that they'll have virtual, a virtual showing on both. KubeCon North America is still proceeding as uh, currently planned. And 
we will be seeing a, they're, they're currently putting together the committees to review the CFPs and we should see a schedule announcement sometime in September. Um, in terms of announcements, it's not really an NSM announcement, uh, but you know, just to make sure everyone is available or aware rather, um, Dan Cohn is no longer uh, heading the CNCF, but he is still with the Linux Foundation and he's taken over a new effort called the Linux Foundation Public Health. And so uh, we'll still see lots of Dan, but uh, they've announced a, uh, a new person to, to run it. Uh, and I'll have to get her, her name and added to the agenda. Um, but this person was uh, the, I believe the head evangeliz evangelizer uh, over at uh, GitLab. And uh, we should see some really good work in the CNCF um, come from her leadership. Um, in terms of the social media community team, uh, we have an additional uh, follower and are following five more people. We've posted out 25 uh, tweets, which includes the last week's video recap, call reminders, the weekly webinars. Uh, the introduction of uh, T-Mobile has a gold member. So welcome T-Mobile to the CNCF. And there is also a virtual uh, Linux Foundation AI Day EU that's going to be on June 22nd. So if you're interested in artificial intelligence, definitely consider signing up. There is also information on Linux Foundation uh, training. And uh, there is information on a CNTT white paper. Uh, CNTT is something that I have personally have been involved, um, involved with. Uh, my involvement has been primarily making sure that uh, that the wording of it is as generic as, as possible and we can try to minimize uh, vendor, uh, vendor lock-in. Uh, it's still early in its life cycle, so there's still a lot of work to do in, in that space. So this is just one of the early, uh, one of the early releases uh, that's, that's being done. Um, the, there's also information on 5G and Wi-Fi 6 in telecom TV and network architecture and where cloud native, um, what does cloud native mean to that space? Um, we also have a post in VMware Open Source about uh, the latest learnings from the open source community. And there is information on CNF testbed where the mobile telecom industry is making rapid uh, progress uh, in conjunction with the CNF testbed. Uh, LinkedIn posted the same information. We've added an additional follower there. And uh, we have pending updates uh, on NSMCon EU 2020. Um, and we are going to, once we get some clarifications from the CNCF, we will begin promoting registration and uh, and uh, sponsorship and schedules and so on. So in terms of the main agenda, we have uh, at the top, of, we uh, make sure to put your names on, on this stuff as well if you're, if you're the speaker so I know who to hand that off to. Uh, but to start with, we have a proposal on control plane and data plane separation. So who's going to, um, who's going to take that? Is this us? Is it Tarek or did you, Rosina tell you this about this? Or Sorry, I didn't again. quite understand that. Can you repeat that, please? Is this one? Did, did Rosina put this one on the agenda? Yeah, I, 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 think okay. she, yeah, I, I think she reached out and said that um, that it was going I to be next week. think it might be delayed for next week. Yeah. 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 I, I, but I... I, I, I suggested that we keep it on the agenda just to give someone an opportunity to sort of say a few words about what we could expect to hear about next week uh, in the hopes that it will uh, prove of interest to people and encourage more folks to come around and, and hear you talk about it. And I, can, I can speak a bit about it. It's a book we have done and the naming is maybe not, it's, it's about application data and control plane separation. So it's actually to implement a service that that will be the control. The control of the service would, would be like the IPAM and stuff like that, but we would have a data forwarder directing the stream in a completely other direction. So that's what's more or less about. Oh, fantastic. That, that sounds interesting. I think you and I talked about this before Ed, a long time ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and I'm sympathetic as to the naming things problem. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the old joke, there are only really three problems in computer science. Um, <laughs> you know, basically, it's, it's cache coherence, 
off by one errors and naming things. <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be fantastic. So we'll make sure that ends up in the uh, the main agenda next week. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm definitely interested in uh, in hearing what uh, uh, what has to be said there. Yeah, we think it's also really good with, with the, the latest development of, your, of the forwarding, I mean, the new architecture of, of NSM, because I think that could help us to do this. But I hope so. Yeah, and, and one of the things, uh, just to, um, uh, not to dive too deeply into this, but one of the things that I think is, uh, is going to happen is that his, historically, the application would always uh, weld itself to the to the infrastructure of your environment, and uh, we've progressed in time through a variety of advancements so that the application can bring some of its own uh, architecture. So they're no longer told you will bring in this specific database and you will use these specific uh, uh, mm -hmm. primitives. Instead, the developer might say, "Oh, I'm going to use Node.js and I'm going to use." Uh, and I'm going to use MySQL or, or uh, Redis or MongoDB or whatever. And so it gave a lot of power to the, to the developers, which gave rise to the entire, uh, uh, the, to the entire DevOps style uh, as part of the development team. But one of the things is that as we progress forward, I think we're going to see, as you're describing in here, application-based control planes and uh, data plane separations. And I think that's, to me, it looks like this stuff is leading towards, uh, instead of the application responding to the architecture of the, of the data center, the data centers could also respond to the architecture of the applications and can form themselves based upon that because the control planes are being, uh, are eventually uh, maturing to the point where they can take such, uh, such input and do them in a, in a safer way. And so I'm looking, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to seeing what has, what you all have to say in that space and uh, we'll, we'll make sure it definitely happens. Um, and we will try to add a bit of background and, and so on and, and put it in, in context also so it's digestible for everybody. Fantastic. Sorry here, I'm one of the colleagues here. Context, context is always good, um, especially because one of the exciting things with network service mesh is we have a, people coming from a bunch of different directions. So we've mm -hmm. got a bunch of deep networking people. Um, we've got a bunch of sort of more cloud native people. And, and one of the exciting parts is we all share very different context. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of stuff that's intuitive to one group of folks that's not to others. So mm -hmm. explaining context is always very helpful. Mm -hmm. So next week, hopefully, when we will, we will show. I'm excited. Cool. We have um, NSM operator updates by Alex. So Alex, you have work. Oh, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. C can you hear me well? I don't know if my microphone is working. We can hear you. Oh, cool, cool, nice. So. Um, so basically, uh, um, I think I already shared with Fred and also add a little bit of what I'm uh, struggling with uh, in the NSM operator, especially in trying to uh, accommodate the network search mesh inside OpenShift, which, which is also a goal for the operator. So it happens that OpenShift works with um, a different API server uh, that has a lot of networking, especially uh, network objects that we can retrieve information from that. And I know that the network search mesh application needs to retrieve all the prefixes uh, that are being used by the platform, maybe uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes. And there is a different way of doing that. So, uh, I ha I'm working on that right now this week. I'll, I'll be working probably a, a big slice of the week on that. But I have, I have a big question on that specific thing that, that should uh, change a little bit the game and running network service mesh on top of OpenShift. And the question would be uh, how often um, client Go or something like client Go is being used to talk to the Kube API server in Kubernetes in 
the NSM code base. Like I, I've seen a few bits, but I don't know if I will need to do that uh, a lot of times. So this is one thing. It may be kind of a silly question because I'm not completely familiarized with the code base. But uh, from the perspective of getting the prefixes out of the platform to to be to make the, the network service mesh application aware uh, of those prefixes and and say hey we need to exclude those because they are in use. Uh, that one I've seen. I don't know if I need to do other networking queries to the platform because in that case I need to use a different client because OpenShift has a, a, its own client Go. Uh, it's the same as Kubernetes when I, when I need to talk to the Cube API server, but if I need special objects that are already developed inside OpenShift, I need a different client because that one will have network getters and that, that method will bring a lot of networking information that OpenShift is using. Okay. So I mean, I, 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 this is starting to feel to me like a uh, modularity for the win kind of problem. Um, which is that um, effectively the so you, you basically have said you, you you OpenShift has its own client Go that is a drop in replacement for client Go if you're doing things that client Go normally does but does other things besides right oh uh, not not exactly not exactly okay. Actually, the client Go uh, for Kubernetes is exactly the same for OpenShift. But okay. when you when you need to talk to something special that this is only inside OpenShift, uh, depending on what it is, then I need a different one. Only in that case. So net networking in that case, I have a, a very special way of doing things that will be pretty mm -hmm. easy if I use a different client. Uh, but for all the rest, it's a regular client goal. Okay. Okay. Got it. I got it. I got it. Um, and, and so like. The thing to understand is that it's the 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 prefixes the the go figure out what prefixes you should exclude. Um, if you it's there's an attempt made to actually keep that at arm's length from the core of network the implementation of that at arm's length from the core of network service mesh, because even though network service mesh fits hand in glove with Kubernetes, we don't weld to Kubernetes, right? And so my general sense is that what you would probably end up doing is uh, effectively writing something that simply gathers the exclude prefixes differently um, as a separate sort of, 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 you know, package. And then either we already have, or we would need to make sure that we arrange to have the proper modularity so that one could configure the choice of using that to get exclude prefixes in. Or we could automatically figure out that that's the right thing, right? I presume there's some way to figure out that you're running an open shift, correct? Yeah, there is, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Right. So, I mean, you could, you could literally essentially write it as a separate package so that you've got nice tight modularity and then okay. go back to where we're making the decision and say, okay, we need to make sure we have proper modularity and, and something here needs to sort of look around the world and say, okay, this is the environment I find myself in. Therefore, I'm going to use this to get the exclude prefixes. Sure. Yeah, because okay, cool. you, you know what's even better than configuration? Just working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 sure 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 uh no that, that's that's totally fine i'll try to to modularize that and then and make it uh let's say uh, uh independent of everything else um and yeah the, the other two things i'm working on one one is capability tracing i'm doing that in parallel so i have a few tools here because in OpenShift, uh the privilege permission is a problem because we'll need to um, we need we, we'll need to to touch some knobs to make make it work, and it's better if I can really uh, really uh, narrow down the permissions. And I've seen um, the init container that is injected from the admission controller is asking for mm -hmm. permissions. Um, forwarding plane, the, network the service init, managers. The init container should not require any special permissions. Yeah, it should but just be an init container. So if you're okay, seeing it asking for any permissions, let us know because that that sounds like a that sounds like a bug. Yeah. We yeah, okay, yeah it's, we, we, it's not. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. No, please, please. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 not requesting the permissions actually. It doesn't request the permissions. 
and running inside OpenShift, it gets rejected, it gets permission denied. So it's actually trying to do something that requires permission. Okay, okay. So basically the OpenShift security model, we need to figure out what it is and what it is exactly. that OpenShift thinks it needs to do it and then decide from there what, what, how to proceed, right? Because exactly. how to proceed is gonna depend entirely on sort of why OpenShift is grumpy. Um, because it may be like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen something where like exactly like the situation where it turns out there were five possible ways we could have done the thing. And we picked number three and the, the place that is now grumpy would have been perfectly delighted with numbers two or number five. And so why don't we just pick one that works more broadly, right? Yeah, that's true. Also, that's true. Does it just get flat out rejected or does it work for, a, does it run for a short period of time and then, and then get rejected? No, it actually gets rejected. Uh, it's working because I, I made my own build of the admission controller asking for those permissions. So it works. But I'm, I'm, the permissions are too large, like privileged or something like that. And I know this is a very tiny thing. It's not something big, right? So uh, it's just a matter of actually tracing the capabilities, understanding why uh, they are there. And once I have that, it will be uh, good to go. So this is why I'm working on tracing capabilities from, from the process perspective to understand how I can translate that into the security context, both from the pod and the container, and, and, and then translate that into a, a policy inside OpenShift that say, hey, you are allowed to ask for those because you are working with that and that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, as, as a general rule, my vast preference would be to try and figure out a way that we don't have to ask OpenShift for anything magic or special there. Um, okay. Because, because our, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, it may not be possible, right? Uh, but generally speaking, in every other environment we've dealt with, the init container is able to do its work in a completely unprivileged way. I mean, fundamentally, because like literally all the init container do is doing, 100% of all it's doing is coming up, um, opening a Unix file socket that has been presented by the device plugin and making a gRPC call. That's basically it. That's all it does. Right. So, uh, I, I, I guess <clears throat> the socket is in the slash var directory. Am I correct? Okay. So that, yes, it is, it is in the slash var directory just because that's sort of the traditional Unix place to push such things. Um, yeah. And so as, as a good example of like sort of the, um, as a good example of, of, of the point I was making earlier about sometimes you just discover that, you know, you had five choices, you picked one and the other, and that's the one that makes everything grumpy. If the issue really is that OpenShift is for whatever reason grumpy about us using a Unix file socket in slash var, I would be enormously more inclined to adapt to that and put the socket someplace that is not going to make for a grumpy OpenShift than to convince OpenShift that it should open up what it considers to be a broader set of security permissions. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. I'll try that then. Instead of trying to trace the capabilities, I'll just change the folders and see if it is um, about that. Yeah, if, if okay. it is about that, then, then we can have a really, really good conversation about that. I'm, I'm ever so slightly curious as to why OpenShift is grumpy about having Unix file sockets inside a container in slash var. Um, but I, oh. I also know, you know that there's, there's, there's limitations to my understanding of, of, of security in the world. And so sometimes you just sort of shrug and say, security people, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true, that's totally true, yeah. I, I, I've been struggling with that myself. <laughs> That's totally true. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, but, but anyway, like if, if that's it, I mean, like one of the, the central tenets of cloud native is immutable infrastructure. And, and we try and respect that as much as we possibly can um, because it, it does end up making the world a, a much simpler place. Cause you could easily imagine, right? Like a world where somebody wants to install network service mesh and they don't have permissions to loosen the security constraints in OpenShift for whatever reason, right? Sure. Or they need to now go convince someone to loosen that security constraint and nobody really understands why it's there because quite frankly, like I can't tell you off the top of my head why you would have that. I'm sure there's a good it, reason. You, it, you it mean also, the security constraints? No, the, the one that says you can't have a socket and var inside a pod, right? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I, I, uh, that, I, that one, I, uh, I, that one, I think uh, that one is there for his, historical reasons and it's more Linux related than OpenShift itself. 
because this slash var uh, directory, uh, I think needs needs some some root access, but I don't know how far it should be secured. So I need I need to check that yet yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, like sure. I said, it's just it's a it's always easier um, to figure out a way to get around something like this by just letting the security people be pedantic about what they're pedantic about, right? So, but what I don't want to have happen is you know some poor user have to go and you know force some weird SE Linux policy into the world that they don't understand why it was there to begin with, which means it's marginally dangerous for them to change it because it's generally not a good idea to change security things you don't understand. Um, yeah, that's you know, we, we don't want them to have to do that. That, that gets to be ugly. Well, it also makes the conversations with the security teams much easier because when you're applying something that says, hey, you need to go apply this SC Linux thing, and then you have to explain to the security, uh, to the security team why you're doing it, uh, it it's, it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more painful to have that conversation than to than to just work in an unprivileged way. So, so this is uh, this is fantastic information, and uh, thanks for thanks for tracking that down. And uh, uh, would love to see whether or not just moving it into maybe slash run slash network service mesh or some other similar uh, some other similar location uh, mm -hmm. to see if that just uh, if that just works. Yeah, and, and that, that's an easy enough thing to try. And then, then we get to the really fun discussion of, okay, what, what exa where exactly should we put it under what circumstances? Um, because you, you get then sort of two pieces of, of tension, one of which is, as a general rule, you want to, a, a, as a general rule, you want to try and follow tradition as much as you can, which would say put it in bar run. Um, and so we're not gonna be able to do that for security reasons that we aren't even interested in figure, you know, we don't care because we don't care to argue about them, right? There are security reasons, mumble, mumble. Um, and so, okay, what's the next best choice that we can make that, that hues towards tradition? Although if you do hear why it's like that, I do care from a personal perspective, not just from an MSN perspective. Yeah, I, so, I, I do too, just because the more I understand what's going on in the heads of the, little, in, in the, the, the brains of security people, uh, the, the more easily I can actually work with them. But like, like not asking you to try to chase that down, that reason down. Just if you happen to come across it, or if someone happens to talk about it, then uh, that'd be that'd be an interesting story. But um, yeah, in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of this, it's just try a different directory and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, let us know, and uh, yeah. we'll we'll help you with trying to to work out why it's uh, why it's doing that, and, and try to find a resolution that. As uh, uniform across uh, as as many systems as possible. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, anyway, anyway, the tracing the capabilities will actually tell me exactly what is happening because it will be like uh, uh, the process will 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 try to do a, some some sort of system call at some point uh, behind the scenes. Uh, trying to do something and the kernel will reject that because of some policy that it's on top of it. So I'll be able to see what is happening and 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 look in uh, a little bit deeper into that. So, but for sure, I'll try uh, using a non-privileged path and, and see what happens. Uh, and, and that leads us to a uh, third topic, which is pretty much related, which is the service accounts that are used uh, in Kubernetes to run uh, all the workloads, they need to be attached with a security context constraint uh, in order to allow everything to run. And it includes the examples. So if I, if I try to, um, to deploy a new network service, that one also needs to be ran under a specific service account. And in terms of the operator, the operator lifecycle manager is capable of uh, creating those accounts and let them like pre-created for any service account. And I don't know if it is a good uh, practice in terms of network service mesh to have one specific service account for all the network services uh, that are being deployed or if it is too much, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, so I, I think part of what you're gonna run into there is that much of what we're using the service accounts for um, is that uh, Spire can trigger off of the service accounts in order to issue uh, spiffy IDs. 
So what you're probably going to discover is that it is perfectly okay to have organized your, your network services by service accounts in whatever way makes sense to you. And I, I tend to be on team um, as granular as you can get away with without driving yourself insane. Um, like, so I, I like granular, granular groupings of things. So I would tend to you know, want more granular service accounts. But it is going to need to be the case then that there is a spiffy a selector for Spire that will cause it to issue an identity to those service accounts. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. So uh, yeah, I gotta I, I gotta take a look on that too. Okay. Okay, I see. I I actually need to run uh, with the Spire enabled and mm -hmm. and see and see how things will work with this specific service account. And I guess uh, one thing that you guys mentioned on Slack is about the NSC and DNSC, how an, op how an operator could help with those guys. I don't know if you have a specific question on that, if you wanna try to discuss that later. Well, I mean, I, I can sort of, I can, hum, I can hum a few bars if that's helpful. So the, the, I think the reason, the thing we sort of mentioned on Slack was um, as we look at things like the VL3 network service endpoint, right? The, the, sorry, the VL3 network service, which has a bunch of NSCs and they sort of interrelate in slightly more complicated ways than some of the, the things that we've built so far. So what, what do you do in a Kubernetes system when you have slightly more complicated systems of things? Your, your, your mind immediately turns towards an operator. Um, and I don't know if this ends up being a separate VL3 NSC operator or if it ends up being some aspect of the network service mesh operator. Um, my, my knee jerk reaction, just because I tend towards modularity, um, is towards having a separate operator. But as I think you sort of mentioned persuasively in our Slack discussions, there may be very elegant ways of just rolling these in a generic sense under the existing operator. And I'm a huge fan of elegance. Um, the other thing though, that's a little bit interesting and tricky when you talk about the VL3 is it ends up being something that spans potentially many, many, many clusters. So there's no one cluster in which you would run its operator, if that makes sense. Okay. And I'm not okay, sure gotcha. what the story is around that yet. Okay. So I, yeah, I, I need to test, uh, I need to understand how, how, how this, these NSCs are working mm -hmm. together in order to- So, to, and, and if you yeah. ping uh, Denise on Slack, he can point you okay. to sort of the, he's, he's currently building out some design documents on this that can give you some notion of where Perfect. we think we're going. Um, and, and again, this is not like a burning issue yet. Um, it's just, you know, I, I find the world is much easier when, when I can sort of like think about things in the back of my head for more time, not like actively think about them, but just have them bouncing around in my imagination. And so I, I will often mention sort of perspective things to people for this reason. Okay, cool, cool. I'll definitely do that. Yeah, I'll try to address those those uh, first permission problems. So this week I'll have some a resolution in some of them, and uh, and then I'll see how the operator could embrace uh, another API. Maybe if not, uh, it may be a new operator. It's it's not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I one of the things that I think will end up happening is from the from the operators uh, from the operator side is. Um, I, I can I can see a couple a couple possible integrations um, for how the endpoints themselves could uh, could make use of it. So one of them could be uh, if you if you have dependent services that you need to to run, like suppose you have a uh, uh, an intrusion detection system that requires access to some queue or to some to some database. And so the operator can help with uh, with configuring and maintaining all of that uh, all of that information, and uh, for, and helping out with some of the with some of the state in regards to like how do you how do you upgrade it or how do you uh, how do you recover from certain types of failures and the operator can be that thing that helps uh, that helps with that. Now the the second one that we can drive towards as well is when we start to deploy. Uh, certain types of, uh, of workloads out there. Uh, for example, you might in the series use case you have uh, 
we, we, we have the example where you have uh, a pod connected to a firewall, to an intrusion detection system, to, to a VPN. And in those scenarios, uh, the management of the top level uh, of, of the top level objects and ensuring that they get uh, created in the in the correct way in a uniform way that is that's easy to to manage uh, becomes very very useful and uh, I'll drive down a little bit more deeply into that when I when I say management management of this I don't just simply mean go run Q control apply and then you're and then you're done like when you start running a, a larger number of these across a higher number of pops then you start to you start to see uh, environments where you have to manage all of these things in um, in uh, a higher uh, in a higher number, and it becomes unmanageable if you have to touch a bunch of things. So, how do you make sure that you update all of your wiring so that you keep the that uniformity across the the lot of them? The operator is also a potential path towards making sure that that synchronization happens and and takes place. So, so I'm also thinking of, of uh, use cases like that that help us with the, the unified management of, of some of these systems as opposed to just uh, as a potential solution for that. Uh, and not just aiming towards, uh, let, let's make sure this thing stays online. Does, uh, does that make sense? Uh, totally, uh, it totally makes sense. Uh, what, what I see there is like um, modeling if I have a custom resource that could represent that system, then I can model uh, the status field on that resource with a lot of very uh, specific information. And the operator as a control loop, as, as a controller, will be uh, watching that status field all the time, uh, watching for all of those resources, and, and it will take action upon any kind of state that you are uh, retrieving from the various uh, components for, for, for that specific custom resource. So that's kind of how the operator works. And so I, I, I totally agree that this is a very good use case. Yeah, no, there, yeah. there's a whole lot of interesting stuff here to explore, no question. And, yeah. and we're just getting started. Like, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we're gonna find a, a, a whole range of uh, patterns that we're, that we're going to be able to make use of this stuff. And so, uh, and the trick behind it is that all the communication between the two perform the actual connection and discovery uh, is still NSM driven, that that still occurs. But on the northbound side of that, uh, we can have something that consumes the monitoring and we have things that consume, uh, that, that consume uh, things about the environment that it's able to access and is able to, to help with the management of those systems. Like, I have a, uh, I have a, I have a firewall, maybe it's a, a bump in the firewall, uh, it's a stateless firewall. Uh, just take a super simple example. You know, and am I, am I scaling that properly? Like, even that one question alone uh, is something that an operator can, uh, can help out with uh, tremendously, especially when you start looking at uh, let's go pull the CPU stats out of, uh, out of Kubernetes and let's go pull the connection stats out of, uh, out of network service mesh and try to work out if, uh, if uh, the firewall is going to uh, start running into, into scaling issues with its current configuration and expand that configuration out. You know, so just like dead simple, dead simple uh, approach and technology underneath of it. And the operator on top of that can, uh, can potentially can potentially help do that, not just from a single cluster, because you could do some of this through through the standard uh, uh, through some of the standard objects in Kubernetes in a limited way, but to be able to do this potentially across clusters as well. So there's so there's a lot of really interesting things that we can uh, that we can look at that uh, that will enable interesting behavior. And I would love to get a repository of uh, of uh, templates or samples that people who are building these type of things on top of NSM can, can start off with one of those things and eventually uh, just uh, use that as a template to add additional functionality on, on top of it or to have some pluggable systems that they can configure and, uh, and just tell it to go. So just as some ideas moving towards, uh, towards the future. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty interesting, yeah. 
There is a lot, a lot to explore for sure. Cool. Uh, we need to make sure we get into the open policy agent stuff as well. Do you have anything else before uh, before we move on? Cool. I'm not hearing you, so I assume the answer is uh, is that you're good. Cool. So, open policy agent. Uh, who's the main person for that? So I, I think Denise has been doing a lot of the work. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we highlighted that there's cool stuff going on there. Um, do you want to say a few things about it, Denise? Oh, uh, we just started to implement uh, open policy policies for NSM. We have added uh, two policies for token expiration and also for token validation. Um, mostly that's it. Yeah, it, we, there, there's also a nice modularization of how these policies are handled. So effectively, um, it, it's very easy then to mix and match a bunch of really well done default policies in with custom behaviors that you may want um, to have. So you can, for example, say, well, I actually have custom policy behaviors about who I want to allow to talk to this network service endpoint. In, in but you know, here's a few characters to also mix in making sure that sort of default behaviors around token expiry and, and validation are actually being done correctly as well. So it, it, it should make the system very easy and flexible from a policy point of view. Um, in terms of, uh, so in terms of, uh, policy, so this is, uh, this is an area that we're going to continue to, uh, to work on, to try to find ways to simplify the, um, uh, not only how do you, uh, how do you build, uh, build and consume the policy within the network service mesh chain itself, but to also, uh, focus on the easy use of of uh, integrating and using policy as as an operator. So if if you have uh, any uh, if you have any suggestions or it's something you want to to jump in and get involved with and help as well, uh, definitely let me and Ed know and we'll we'll help you get involved in, in that uh, in that area. Um, let's see. We have ten minutes left in the uh, in the call. Is there, uh, is there any other topics that anyone would like to bring up? Okay, well, as a, uh, as a reminder, we have the uh, application uh, control and data plane separation next week. So uh, we will make sure that there's time for, for that. And uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for your time and we will see you all again at the same time next week. Take care.